so when when did he actually do those studies and what are the cliff notes in terms of what he found and what he measured? Well, he, he published a couple of papers in Archives of General Psychiatry, I believe, in the early 93, 94, something like that. Um, and uh, in addition to seeing modest increases in blood pressure and heart rate, the people at the higher doses uh, ha- ha saw these aliens. Uh, you may have heard about all this. And so he wrote a book called DMT, The Spirit Molecule, where these people had discussed, you know, when they took these high doses of DMT, they were transported to an alien landscape and they saw these alien beings and creatures, uh, DMT elves, whatever. And Terrence McKenna had talked about this. Terrence McKenna, of course, was an early smoker of DMT and had talked a lot about the DMT elves and the DMT entities, et cetera. But Strassman, as far as I know, was really interested more in the possibility that DMT could be produced in people with schizophrenia and mental illness and that that was producing the symptoms. Hmm. And so so this idea, I mean, it's it's a very intriguing idea. It would imply that um, you know there's there's some level of endogenous DMT production in the brain, um, either all the time, um, or it gets released at specific under specific circumstances, or in you know under certain pathological conditions. Um, is there much evidence for this? How, what do we actually know today about you know any evidence that there's detectable DMT in the brain at levels that would make it relevant for some of these things? There are detectable levels of DMT in the brain. If you use HPLC, LC mass spec, you can detect it. Um, I actually wrote a review article. I was invited to speak at uh, a breaking convention conference in um, in London some years ago, and uh, they wanted me to talk about DMT as an endogenous molecule. I said, well, I don't believe it really is. He said, that's why we want you to come. And so I gave a talk about it and present all the evidence and said, there's not enough there. There's not enough there. He got a biochemist and a couple of other people um, to provide data to suggest that, you know, if they strangled rats, for example, the levels of DMT in the rat brains went up. So he said, well, maybe when people are dying, maybe the near-death experience is DMT. But when you strangle rats, every, everything goes up. They have a tremendous flood of all kinds of transmitters in the brain because their brain's dying and, you know, it's the, the trauma and stress are releasing it. Um, they, they're still uh, there's still a group of people that talk about DMT as an endogenous molecule that's produced in uh, significant amounts. <clears throat> but uh, I really don't I don't subscribe to the idea that that, that happens. Um, there are many other things that I've pointed out things if someone's under stress, things like endorphins are produced and endorphins are more potent than DMT. Um, and can mm-hmm. produce um, weird psychiatric effects and, and mental effects. So I, I actually don't believe there's any evidence for it. But uh, he and uh, and, um, and Steve, um, well, there's a there's a bio- Barker, yeah, Steve Barker, and he's in uh, Louisiana, and um, and then there's another biochemist I think in Michigan, and they provided data where <clears throat> they've claimed that you know there's enough produced and. It could be concentrated. Nick Cozy said, well, it could be concentrated in the uh, vesicles and could cause, you know, the release. And But it's it's really, in my opinion, this is a house of cards. Um, it's it's really, it's a cute hypothesis. You think when somebody's dying and they have a near-death experience and have these visions that it could be a flood of DMT. But I just don't, I just don't buy into that at all. <clears throat> I don't think the evidence is very strong. Um, there are just a few people that really are pushing this point of view, but it's, it's a cute theory. People like it. Mm-hmm. Why? Um, so, you know, we kind of touched on earlier, um, Charles, through some of your work on inflammation, you know, you pointed out that psilocin and DMT, even though they're, they're very similar chemically, they have very different effects um, in your inflammation model. Um, obviously, one of the other things that characterizes DMT that people always talk about is just the the potency and the vividness of the subjective effects, um, together with the fact that it's so short lasting. Um, even you know that's you know it's very close to psilocin in terms of chemical structure, but you know it lasts for a few minutes as opposed to a, a several hours long mushroom trip that you can get with uh, magic mushrooms. What is it? You know, do we know or understand why the subjective effects are so potent and and the uh, and the drug doesn't last that long in terms of the structure and how it's interacting with receptors and things like that? Yeah, I think a lot of that is just the pharmacology and the route of administration um, that DMT itself is not orally active. 
unlike, unlike psilocybin. Mm. Uh, psilocybin is a Zwitter ion that has that phosphate that stabilizes it. So it can be taken orally. And when you take psilocybin orally, I think the, the length of time is really the absorption into, into the circulatory system from the gut. Because if you, I, th and I think some of early imaging papers were done with intravenous psilocybin and that was about a 20 minute trip with some of those. I think they were doing that in the David Nutt's lab for some of those early imaging studies. So it's not necessarily that the one drug lasts more than the other. It's really the route of administration. If you smoke it or inhale it, it's going to go directly into your circulatory system and then it will be metabolized through monoamine oxidase largely. Um, but I for psilocybin, it's, it's, it's oral. It's, yeah. And that, that would, that would, that would make sense of why ayahuasca, which is just orally active DMT lasts yeah. much longer than mm -hmm. inhaled DMT. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. The beta it lasts several beta, hours. The beta carlines and ayahuasca prevent monoamine oxidase from breaking the side chain down. In fact, I've argued that ayahuasca is basically just an orally active uh, psilocybin type molecule. This, the, the effects are very similar. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Um, another, you know, sort of another interesting comparison is you've got, you know, DM, DMT, NN DMT, uh, which most people just refer to as plain DMT. And then you've got 5 methoxy DMT. So very similar chemically, um, very intense experiences that people report with these two drugs. Um, usually they're inhaled, so they're both short acting, uh, but the content of the experience is very different. So what, what is what, what do we know about the differences between DMT and 5-MeO DMT that account? For their differences there's a couple of pharmacological things right off the bat the psychedelic effects presumably are mediated by activation of 5-ht2a receptors but 5-methoxy dmt in animal models and also in vitro has really powerful effects in stimulating the serotonin 1a receptor mm. and 1a receptors are also expressed on uh, the axons of a of the cortical pyramidal cells so they actually have a different effect. Um, and we don't really understand that, but probably the 5-methoxy DMT, the fact that it's so different is related to the fact that it's such a powerful 5-HT1A agonist. DMT doesn't have that much 5-HT1A agonist activity, but 5-methoxy DMT is a really potent 5-HT1A agonist as well. Mm -hmm. And is that is that, um, is that that something that distinguishes 5-MeO DMT from most other psychedelics? Do most of them not interact with this receptor or do so much more weakly? Much more weakly, um, the phenethylamines, like mescaline, don't really activate it at all. It's mostly the tryptamines. Um, and there again, 5 methoxy dmt is almost unique. Some people have called it the god molecule because, you know, you completely lose consciousness. And uh, whereas with DMT, it's more entertaining and visual. 5 methoxy mm -hmm. dmt really shuts off uh, people's consciousness. Mm -hmm. And nobody, you know, we just, we're, we're too early in the study of these to really understand what it is. But it, if you look at a cortical pyramidal cell, the 5-HT2A receptors are on the apical dendrites and they activate the cells so they fire more easily, they increase the gain. 5-HT1A receptors, among other places, are located on the axons and they hyperpolarize. So they almost mm. counteract the effect on the pyramidal cells that you see when you activate the 2A receptors. But the 1A is also located in other places in the brain. So we really don't understand, I mean, you know, the brain is much more complex than we can possibly comprehend. And although we know a lot more than we used to, I think it's just there are subtle nuances. And also the idea that you have some differences in signaling. A DMT activates the receptor and you, you probably generate a certain set of signals, you know, restin and, and G proteins. 5-methoxy DMT activates the same receptors, but probably also direct targets different types of intracellular signaling molecules. So it's it's pretty com i think it's more complex i see but but you know to a first uh, approximation if we know yeah. that 5-HT2A receptors are often concentrated in the apical dendrites um, of certain neurons in certain parts of the brain um, and you said 5-HT1A is often concentrated on the axons and has a hyperpolarizing effect right. um, we would expect drugs that hit the 1A and 2A receptor to have a very different pattern of activity that they elicit from one that primarily hits 2A but not 1A yeah right? i mean you yeah. yeah, it's like for, for tryptamines, like, like like DMT and psilocin, it's about a one-to-one -one ratio in how it's interacting with the 2A to the 1A. But 
for 5-MeO-DMT, there's about a hundredfold selectivity for 1A over 2A. So it's a, it's a weak agonist to 2A and a really oh, wow. good at the 1A. So wow. it's, it's almost a selective 1A agonist with some 2A activity. Hmm. If you do animal experiments with 5 flux dmt and one other, some other psychedelic, almost any other psychedelic, the animals respond to activation of the 5 ht 2 a receptor. But if you go into, um, say, rats and you give 5 methoxy dmt the primary salient cue that they pick up on is activation of the serotonin 1A receptor. So it's, it's really a difference in pharmacology there. Interesting. Um, so one of the, so that's a very different. Uh, that's an interesting difference in pharmacology. One of the other things that is is very interesting about five meo DMT to me, other than the experience itself, is um, and I've heard other people report this, but I'm not sure to what extent it's it's been formally studied. Um, but but I've had two separate experiences with five meo DMT in my life, and I, I will never forget the first one because I was told with confidence ahead of time by the by the person um, overseeing this, that uh, 5-MeO-DMT was very likely to result in what he called reactivations. And he said that this would be um, uh, some kind of uh, experience similar to the drug experience long after the drug had worn out the next day, the day after, and so forth, where you would basically trip to some extent again, probably at night while you were sleeping. Um, and that this could happen for days or even weeks after after the drug administration. And at the time, you know, I, I just sort of silently listened to this and, and I thought to myself, you know, I've never heard of anyone actually having an acid flashback or anything like that. I've never heard of this. I I, I didn't I didn't buy it. Um, but I'll be damned if <laughs> just that didn't happen. Um, I would say for about two weeks, you know, every night I would wake up um, in the early morning hours and, and have, you know, probably an experience that was roughly fifty to eighty percent of what the actual drug experience was. Um, is that something that's been reported widely for five meo DMT and has it been studied at all? It's not something I've heard of. You may be a very suggestible personality. <laughs> yeah. No, but, it's, uh, it's 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 it's. I think it's been written about, and it's it's not uncommon from from what I understand. And um, so we had a recent publication that uh, was a hypothesis piece that was largely driven by Peter Hendricks graduate student Haley Duran on the hypothesis that the five meo DMT experience and a the therapeutic effect may be due to um, partial seizures in the temporal lobe of the brain because of the overlap of the symptomology between uh, complex partial seizures and the 5-MEO experience with those reactivations that are um, pretty much unique to 5-MEO, mm -hmm. very, very similar to um, uh, sort of recurrent kindled seizures mm -hmm. after a major seizure event. Interesting. Okay. So this, this has been reported, but no, no one's really done careful studies of this no and and i've known people that have that have used 5 flex dmt including myself and that hasn't happened interesting yeah it happened to me the first time but not the second time at all um interesting okay so uh i'm also just interested more generally in um so so 5 meo dmt is an example of a psychedelic um that has strong interactions with uh other receptors beyond the 5-HD2A receptor. Mm -hmm. Are there any other major psychedelics, psilocybin, LSD, and any of the, the big ones that people are studying most intensively right now that have um, that have interactions with other re receptor systems that we think are going to be important for um, their effects or for potential therapeutic outcomes? So it's primarily the, the phenethylamines like mescaline, like DOI, DOM, DOB, 2CB, they primarily affect just 5-HT2 receptors, um, although there's some interesting data from another lab that is, has pointed towards uh, an additional receptor, but that's unclear what that could be. The tryptamines like psilocin, DIPT, 4-hydroxy DIPT, they all will activate, bind to, um, and activate almost all serotonin receptors, where you have LSD, it's will bind to and produce activity at almost all serotonin receptors and other monoaminergic receptors like dopamine, um, adrenergic. So the studying a drug like LSD makes it sometimes really difficult to interpret what those results are. Um, there is some 
evidence that other receptors like the 5-HT1A are feeding into some of the behavioral effects in rodent models. Um, in humans, I'm not sure if it's really been demonstrated that other receptors are feeding into the effects of either LSD or psilocybin or mescaline-like compounds. I don't think that work has been done. 